So who's winning and losing in Warhammer 40k's latest rule set? Let's talk through every single army in the game and talk about how well they're shaping up relative to the competition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Warhammer 40k armies, win rates and tournament wins with an overview of roughly how armies have been getting on since the last big Warhammer 40k update. We're now just over a month in from the last 40k balanced data slate. People have had plenty of time to test their factions in open conflict against the rest of the world in both casual games and big tournaments. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at who's getting on either well or badly. As per normal, there's plenty of different ways in which you can assess factions doing well. I generally like to focus on just raw army win rates as a rough rule of thumb sort of measurement as to how your army might get on in the average game against another player. I feel like it's pretty good for that kind of purposes, though obviously doesn't say the entire picture. Armies could certainly be skewed by the type of players that choose to play the faction, sample size for how many people are playing, plus various matchups between different factions might have very different pictures, and different terrain sets, and the actual detachment and army being played could all affect things quite a lot, but for a broad brush measure I think it's alright to gauge army strength for the average player. We'll talk through the factions in order of the army win rates, but also check in on a few other things as well, the number of big grand tournaments that each faction has actually won, perhaps showcasing their top tier power in the hands of the best players with the deepest pockets to buy the right armies, and a couple of other things including the player rate at grand tournaments, which definitely goes up and down a fair bit based on how excited people are to play that army right now. I thought I'd also throw in the X and 1 performances per player rate, that one shows armies that have only taken one loss at a tournament and then how likely they are to have that based on the number of people actually entering with those armies. Maybe a slightly more convoluted mechanic but basically just shows how likely the army is to get to the top tables of tournaments and take a whole bunch of wins in a row. Overall I'd say that faction to faction balance does seem quite a lot better than it was in the early 10th meta which was sort of disastrous. But compared to prior to the datasheet it does look like there's a similar sort of number of underpowered factions out there. And there still do seem to be two factions that are dominating more than most. In any case though, let's jump straight in, talk through some of the weaker armies in the game first, and move forward to the ones that seem to be doing the best. First up, let's start out with the factions that appear to be most struggling in the hands of the average player. These ones are either at or below 45% win rate, and as a result might be the subject of balance changes from Games Workshop. It doesn't mean that some of these factions can't be strong on occasion, Guard and Chaos Space Marines in particular both seem to be doing quite well at actually winning big events, but it looks like the average player with them suffers a massive uphill struggle. Several of these ones might be a little bit less frequently played than normal as a result due to being not quite as strong in game at the moment. Overall for numbers of factions ranked down here it maybe feels a little bit worse compared with the last time I made this video. Five factions that seem to be below the 45% win rate compared with I think it was three last time. As we go along we'll build up the big graph once more and see how the factions stack up against each other. First up unfortunately we seem to have the poster boys of Warhammer 40k. These are the Codex Space Marines so not including the Divergent chapters here. It does look like there's some argument that the core Codex Space Marines are the weakest army in the game. 41% win rate at tournaments so around minus 5% from the previous data slate. They still managed to take two big event wins and aren't terrible on the getting to the top tables of tournaments with the X and 1 win rates at 17th of 26 there. The two event wins maybe aren't particularly standout though given that they're the fourth most played faction in Warhammer 40k currently. As per normal loads of players play Space Marines though few are having success compared with the Divergent chapters at least. For their core rules the Space Marines use Oath of Moment for reroll hit rolls against one target then back that up with some different detachment rules. The most commonly played with good success are Ironstorm with raw vehicle strength and lots of good support for armoured and dreadnought lists, Gladius with the fire discipline combo and some bonuses getting units to combat, Firestorm for the advance and shoot and a fair bit of raw salamanders power plus some good synergies with transport and vanguard infiltrating shenanigans, perhaps most famously there with Uriel Ventris and Marnius Kalgar. Kalgar being able to infiltrate with some aggressors and an apothecary, Uriel Ventris teleporting some centurions around. It looks like out of the core chapters it's the salamanders and the ultramarines that are most plagued with good success here. For standout units the space marine choices are kind of vast, lots of things are very usable though maybe not quite as much as a standout now. Games Workshop really did hit a lot of their auto take picks and put them a lot more back in line with the rest in the last update. 
Scouts and infiltrators are really quite handy for objectives, maybe eliminators or that combi weapon lieutenant. Inceptors can still score you secondaries, almost guarantees they will cost you a premium now. For raw vehicle power strength, there's the Redemptor Dreadnought, Gladiator Lancers, Ballistas Dreadnoughts, Vindicators or Repulsor Executioners. People often quite like building around aggressor damage combos, say in Firestorm or in Gladius, often jumping out of the Mighty Lamb Raider. Redeemers are very nice. I've got quite a lot of playable infantry options and the intercessors are okay. I'd say the majority of the characters have their niche. In general, it's hard to be too surprised that the standard core space marines are towards the bottom of the pile in the stats. They were kind of just limping into okay before, and then Games Workshop basically hit all their good options with points increases and didn't give them enough in return. With Space Marines' big unit pool, there's maybe a bit of a difference between the average players list and the absolute top tier home list. With so big a unit pool, people rarely have the absolute optimal army ready to go for the faction. I feel like, admittedly, there might be a bit of warping of the stats for the standard Space Marines that might hurt them a bit more than some armies. They do tend to be played a bit more by newer players, which probably accounts for a percentage point or two. And I feel like there might be an element of some players perhaps jumping ship to pinch a few good units from some of the Divergent chapters, maybe things like adding in Azrael from Dark Angels as a good example. Some players who are basically playing Space Marines might just be playing Space Marines with Azrael, as there's no real disadvantage to using Divergent chapter units if they're stronger than what the Codex Space Marine characters can provide. In any case though, Games Workshop do seem to be struggling to get core Space Marines right. I think they have made it hard for themselves where they can make the core faction strong but not boost Divergent chapters to be kind of overpowered levels if they still want to keep the Divergent chapter units relevant. One Divergent chapter that's also not having such a good time though are the Death Watch. They've got tournament stats are around about 42% win rate, admittedly with very limited data as almost no one's playing them. They're the least played of any army and by quite a wide margin, they've won zero events and are struggling to break into the top tables at all. Like the standard Space Marines, the Death Watch also get Oath of Moment as well for their big re-rolls, and as well as the core Space Marine detachments, they also have their Black Spear Task Force. This one does give you an okay damage boost with the mission tactics for turn-on-turn -turn useful stuff, plus some fun things with teleporting and some bolt weapon stratagems. They do have some fun enhancements with things like the big re-rolls of the Tome of Ectoclades and the teleport shenanigans of the Beacon Angelus. For standout units, I'd likely rate their veterans and Proteus kill teams maybe some of the most interesting. They can load up with the heavy thunder hammers and frag cannons and terminators with cyclone missile launchers. Their unique terminator squad data sheet is kind of interesting as well, getting three heavy weapons per squad of five. Death Watch also make anything with a bolter a little bit more interesting, given some interesting stratagems to help boost those, though unfortunately that is a kind of a weakness given that most of the bolter space marine damage dealers just aren't that strong right now. At least their bolt weapon stratagems was cleared up, but they definitely include heavy bolters and heavy bolt rifles in the last update though. Overall I do feel like they were in a fairly sort of similar place to space marines though. A lot of good supporting rules got nerfed, like scout squads, inceptors, and certain other standout Space Marine data sheets, and they didn't get points cuts on the units that seldom get played to compensate at all. I feel like besides the Proteus kill team, probably the majority of their other units could go down in the index and it wouldn't cause a problem. For whatever reason though, people just really aren't inspired to play Death Watch right now, and those that aren't don't seem to be doing great on average. Next up, we've got the Servants of the Omnisire and the Adeptus Mechanicus, they're winning around about 42% of tournament games right now. They have managed one big event win since the data slate, though the average player is really struggling to break into the top tables. 22 out of 26 for the X and 1 play rates, and only 24 out of 26 for the frequency of players at grand tournaments, so people really aren't choosing to play them either at the moment. That's maybe not too surprising given the reaction to their codex. GW didn't really address the fundamental complaints that people had for Admech, in that they're just playing kind of sort of horde chaff mode at the moment. Units that are really expensive in monetary terms, but cost very little on the board and can't threaten tough stuff. The majority of Admech's success seems to be done with the Skitari Hunter cohort, with things like infiltrating scouts and movement shenanigans, all centred around their Skitari pool of units. For stronger units, the Catafron Breachers still seem to be the go-to for their flat damage dealer type unit, Quite nice with certain tech priests. There's loads of options for cheap board control. Teraxion mass have been used. Dragoons and Iron Striders are cheap and have a bit of threat. As Katari Vanguard jumping out of Dune Riders seem like quite efficient transports for taking the front line. Overall though, I think the players would really quite like to see a bit of a reform to Admech, which I think it's safe to say aren't in the place that they'd like them to be. 
which is a bit of a barrier to entry when they're also a very expensive army and one that takes a long time to paint up and get on the board. Next up, at a 43% win rate, we have the Chaos Space Marines. These guys were the single biggest loser since the last balance data slate in terms of win percentages, sliding all the way down from the very top of the game to near the bottom. Despite this though, some people are still managing to make them work. They have won three fairly big events since the data slate came out. I think at least two of those were quite big major grand tournaments. It maybe implies that while they're a faction that most people are really struggling to use that successfully, in the hands of someone who knows all their tricks and knows the exact ways to use their stratagems and play their units, they can still absolutely be a force to be reckoned with. They're sort of middling in player numbers, 12th most played out of the factions, which is actually kind of low for them given the number of fans that the Chaos Marines have, and for the most part they're struggling to break into the top tables for the X and 1 results. Chaos Space Marines have their dark packs to allow you to risk some mortal wounds for either sustained or lethal hits, and they get amped up to the next level with the various marks they can take. It is pretty scary stuff just being able to turn on sustained hits on a 5 plus for any shooting unit with the mark of Nurgle. They back that up with some very strong stratagems, even if they did get toned down a fair bit at the last balance pass, the mark of Nurgle to hide things from shooting at greater than 18 inches is disruptive, and the V-rolls to wound that you can still get from the undivided stratagem are great. The Eye of Zinch can be used to farm command points with dark packs. Lists maybe do seem to have changed a fair bit from the slightly cookie cutter build that they had going on with chosen forge fiends, maybe accursed cultists or some other support. It still seems that a fair amount of that is strong. Chosen led by lords still seem to be used in good numbers. They're brutally dangerous in combat. Possessed are maybe a little bit better to compete now with their devastating wounds. Warp talons are still fine, often with a mark of slanesh. Forge Fiends, Obliterators and Predators can all bring a fair bit of scary shooting, even if you're going to be paying more for the privilege now. Legionaries and Cultists are nice for objectives. Abaddon and Hellbrutes can amplify dark packs. And they've got some fairly good ally access, particularly Nurglings are nice to start in the midfield and screen and do secondaries and things. Overall, I still think they're an interesting enough faction to play. But as you can tell by the win rates, the average player is really not doing well with them right now. It does feel like Games Workshop maybe hit them with a nerf bat just a little bit too hard. Toning down both the stratagems and bumping up the points was maybe just a little bit excessive. Maybe it might have been a bit more sensible to do one or the other, but not both at the same time. In general, though, they're still an army that can bring an obscene amount of damage. They're just really not that durable to back it up. If you can play really carefully with their units, it still seems that top players can win some big events with them. Sticking with the Chaos, and next up we have the World Eaters, the other big loser of the balanced data slate. They slid a big 8% down from 52% down to 44% wins. I feel that reaction to the data slate changes was pretty dismal. They felt like an army that wasn't too far from being balanced, and then Games Workshop just hammered them with a nerf bat. They have won one big event since the data slate, though they seem to be the single worst army for trying to break their way into the top tables. The X and 1 win rate is the very lowest out of any faction, so it means that if you're going into a tournament with a World Eaters, you've got the highest chance out of any army of taking at least two losses. The army rule is the blessings of corn, throwing eight dice and getting two buffs, potentially getting you things like plus two move and advance and charge for some first turn melee threat. Then if you don't need that, you could flex into damage or defensive things. When they get there, the Berserker Warband gives you plus one strength and plus one attack on the charge, which is rather nasty. And if you do have the advance and charge active, you can pay for one unit to auto advance six, meaning that you're almost going to catch something with one scary thing. For standout units, the vast majority of lists also tend to start with Angron still. He moves fast, is fairly tough and breaks things, and then if he does happen to respawn late game, it can potentially be game changing or game winning. And otherwise, they're perhaps particularly well renowned for hitting the enemy with a ton of scary scouting charges early in the game. Lord Invocatus is moving up with tons of 8 bound or exalted 8 bound units. And it seems that the Lord of Skulls is making a comeback, seeing as he was the unit that went down in cost for them. Another scary linchpin of an army that can give you some fairly savage shooting as well as his big melee. Most armies would struggle to deal with both him and Angron at the same time. Just in general, I feel like they hit them too hard. Nerfing two enhancements and putting the points costs up of the 8 bound and certain on foot characters. I feel like given where they were in the game, maybe they could have just nerfed the Master of Executions and Berserker Glaive combo and left it at that. I'm not convinced that they needed to put up 8 bound or Calm the Betrayer really. It seems solid but not overpowered to me. In any case, not completely out of the running at win rate 44. They can still be very, very scary, but certainly slid a fair way from where they were prior to the update. 
Next up, we've got the Hammer of the Emperor that are the Astra Militarum. They're winning around about 45% of games, seemingly kind of unchanged since prior to the data slate. Despite that, they remain very, very popular at tournaments at the moment, the fifth most played faction overall, and their performance beyond that is kind of interesting. They have won four big events since the balanced data slate, including two extra big ones, but beyond that, they're one of the very worst factions to allow you to make your way into the top tables, 25th out of 26 there. Overall, kind of implying that they're an army that can absolutely go all the way in the hands of the best players in the world. They have a lot of interesting stuff for top-end play, but can be really quite underpowered in the hands of the vast majority of players. Their core army rule are the orders, allowing things like move, move, move for extra movement, or plus one to hit, or plus one to your saves for your infantry. Their combined regiment gets you born soldiers for lethal hits if you're static, perhaps particularly helpful for their indirect fire far more than other things really. And beyond that, for their index rules, maybe the most standout one feels like reinforcements for 2 CP to potentially recycle something quite scary like a Kazakin squad or a trio of sentinels. But they also have access to quite a few ways to stacking debuff enemy units, things like fields of fire in particular that you could get free with Ursula Creed, or other nice targeted damage buffs like the rerolls from sentinels, or maybe stripping more AP with the Lehman Ross Exterminator. It is quite nice to see the internal balance of the Astra Militarum being quite so good for the most part. There are perhaps a few auto-include units like Lord Sir Laliontus, maybe Gaunt's Ghosts, and a lot of people are running Kazakin right now. But beyond that, there's quite a lot of ways you can go. Scout Sentinels are great. Borgrin are durable annoyance units that can hold up the midfield and be extra tough against certain things. Kashchan Jungle Fighters can fight forward to be a skirmish screening line with some objective control. The Platoon Command Squad can get Lord Solar's orders where they need to be. They've of course got great indirect fire with Basilisks and Medusas, and Manticores do seem to remain playable despite the nerf. They can do fun infantry tactics with 20 strong infantry, maybe things like Death Corps Krieg with the Marshal for Field No Pain. Gaunt's Ghosts hop around the board to do secondary objectives. Tank Commanders and Rogal Dawn seem to be the way to go if you want some armour on the go. And even things like mechanised guarding chimeras or things dropping in out of reserves like Scions are a lot more interesting post the order update. Overall, they still seem to be fairly similar to how they were before the data slate. A high skill faction that does well in the hands of the best players around, but maybe isn't the easiest to use for most people. They do feel like they could just use a bit more raw strength overall. Even if it came at the price of turning down certain other options, it does feel a bit weird with just about every competitive build, starting with putting Lord Solar in the list, as he just brings so much for how much he costs. Lastly, for the armies at 45% or below, we've got the Sons of Sanguinius in the Blood Angels. They've got win rates of around 45%. Maybe doing a bit better at breaking into the top tables on the X Zone 1 wins, though still haven't won any big events since the data slate, and are currently fairly niche with the play rate compared with what they can be when they get popular. As with the rest of the Space Marines and the Divergent chapters, they primarily get the Oath of Moment for the big rerolls against the one targets. And they can use any of the other Space Marine detachments, though it seems that the most commonly played are the Gladius and the Sons of Sanguinius right now. Sons of Sanguinius actually genuinely having a bit of a resurgence since the buff it got in the balanced data slate. Plus 2 strength and plus 1 attack on the charge is fairly meaningful. The plus 2 strength can put Power Fists up to strength 10, which is quite a good breakpoint. Wounding Terminators on 2s and mainline battle tanks on 4s. Otherwise, Red Rampage is quite a nice damage buff within the detachment, though I feel like a few of the other options are a touch undertuned. For their unique units, they do have a few interesting things. Death Company alongside Lamartes are alright, Mass Power Fists and Inferno Pistols with rerolls to hit, plus minus one damage to keep them safe. Librarian Dreadnoughts can be fun to teleport units around the board, can be nice in Gladius for fire discipline combos there, or Eradicators. Bar Predators could do a bit of threatening Overwatch, and Sanguinary Priests and Dante are alright data sheets, even if I feel like maybe they're the ones trying to carry the jump troops to victory as opposed to being particularly strong jump units in their own right. I still maybe think it's a bit disappointing that Sanguinary Guards still seem to be too expensive for the vast majority of people to bother with. Sons of Sanguinius still doesn't seem standout strong, even though it's got a plus two strength. It definitely seems to have moved it a little bit in the right direction though. And the Space Marine support unit nerfs didn't help with things like scouts and inceptors and things. Overall still kind of on the lower side of power level. I do feel like Sanguinary Guard being made playable would help out the faction quite a bit. As that would give you a big scary fighter unit to build around. It would be quite nice if it was a tempting choice to put Dante with a big squad of them and throw them into battle.
Moving onwards and upwards, here are the factions that I'd rank as sort of lower mid-tier. These ones have win rates between 46% and 48 Here we've got Tyranids on 46 Genesis of the Colts on 47 and then Space Wolves, Chaos Knights, Death Guard and Dark Angels all on 48 right now. First up and starting with the swarms from beyond the galaxy, we have the Tyranids. Their win rate is 46%, kind of similar to Predator Slate. It doesn't look like anyone's actually outright won any tournaments with them yet since that happens, which is perhaps a bit disappointing given that they're the third most played faction at tournaments, given that loads of people started the army with Leviathan and the big launch of 10th edition. Per play rate, they're really struggling to break into the top tiers as well. Their X and 1 wins is one of the lowest out of anyone. For their core army rule, they get Synapse for their leadership shenanigans, plus Shadow in the Warp for making everyone test Battleshot once per game. Occasionally that could be quite impactful, flipping an objective if the opponent gets unlucky. Currently for detachments, it looks like Invasion Fleet is both the most played and having the most success. Things like lethal hits or sustained hits against the armies that you need them against, plus the option to pop up 5 plus fail no pains on things, and a few usable enhancements. Besides that, Vanguard Onslaught, Synaptic Nexus and Unending Swarm are all pretty usable too. For their more standout units, Death Leaper still appears in loads of lists. Neurolictors, despite their much bigger points costs, are still usable. They can certainly play games with objectives and give you some damage debuffs on occasion. Exocrines are nice fire support, as are Maliceptors, good to have on the front line. Haraspexes can be some easy melee damage if you need it. Gargoyles are near auto include for their movement tricks and objective scoring, even if they went up in points slightly. A Neurotyrant is nice for the shadow debuff, plus is kind of good as an overwatch sort of threat. Very nice in Synaptic Nexus in particular. The Terran effects I think is far more playable now with some mid-board overwatch with an acid spray. And Tyranids are kind of propped up a bit by their scoring shenanigans. Biovores and cheap rippers throwing some nuisance units all over the board for doing some secondary objectives and interference. Overall though, by all metrics, they do just feel a bit of an undertuned army right now. A low win percent and very little representation on the top tables of tournaments. I feel like they could use a bit of an overall small power boost really. And even that performance is kind of dependent a bit on their scoring shenanigans to keep them at that sort of rate. Overall feels like they could use just some small buffs to a good number of units. Next up we have their cultist admirers in the Gene Stealer cults. They're again one of the less played factions in Warhammer 40k, though significantly more than Death Watch, so tournament data is a little bit sparing. Overall they've got a win rate of 47%, just a little bit down on what they were before. No big event wins yet, though very low play rates. They do seem to be at least breaking into the top tables at least reasonably often for how often they're played. Their army rule is the cult ambush for the chance to respawn certain units, the detachment rule giving them damage buffs on the turn that they pop up from cult ambush, and their index stratagems and things are rather nice. They've got options for redeploying units, arriving within 3 inches, stacking damage buffs to combine with their data sheets, and they could borrow some guard if it made sense for them. Armies generally tend to play around big blocks of neophytes or acolytes dropping in to lay the enemy low with seismic cannons or demo charges, buffed by Primus rerolls, Ridge Runner AP, or the stratagems. Ideally they can drop in, be some obsec bodies, and then respawn if they get killed. Other fun stuff includes first turn charge aberrants with infiltrate from a character, or the Reductor Saboteur which just packs a surprising amount of explosive damage dealing for a lone operative. They perhaps do feel like a tricky army to play though, and one that you have to play right. Lots of ways that could potentially lead to some big swings against you. Cold ambush tokens getting scrubbed by fast moving units or 3 inch deep strikers. Big overwatch could ruin a unit before it gets to deliver its damage. If they bounce on the alpha strike then they're going to get hit back very hard with their fairly fragile unit profiles. And there's just the chance of just big bad luck. Whether or not certain units respawn could be kind of massive for the value of them. Say so if you had a big aberrant block killed early and it managed to respawn it could be game changing. Or if you had multiple units failed to go back into cold ambush then you really could be on the back foot. Next up we've got the Sons of Rus and the Space Wolves. They're holding fairly steady at a win rate of 48% with Stormlands easily being their best detachment. They have won one fairly big event since the balance data slate. They're doing okay to get into the top tables. Those seem to have really quite low play rates versus the vast majority of factions in the game, 23rd out of 26. I wonder if that's perhaps partly due to them feeling a bit mono build at the moment and going down the route of loads of Thunderwolves, which maybe not every player wants to collect them to the extent where they're going to carry the entire army and maybe have two or three six-man units. The Space Wolves get the Oath of Moment army buffs, 
If they are playing their Stormlance detachment, then they have some very interesting buffs for the Wolves. Big durability things, advance and charge, and various stratagems to support mounted. Gladius and Ironstorm are also pretty strong. Champions of Ross is basically just still not played competitively whatsoever due to the unreliability of those sagas, many of which are just entirely within your opponent's control as to whether or not you achieve to get entire army boosts. Besides those godly Thunderwolves, Logan Grimnar is interesting enough for some cross-board rerolls. Venrisian Wolves are some pretty handy objective secondary doers. I think that Wolfen are very interesting now they've got damage two hammers. They don't do primary objectives, but they're vicious for the points cost. And there's some other usable units like Auric plus Blood Claws or Beyond the Fell Handers. I still say perhaps one of their biggest weaknesses is their unique detachment is just very weedy compared with the competition. The sagas just aren't reliable, and I don't think that Games Workshop's very minor change to them did much. The Stormlance Force also makes them just very Thunderwolf focused, which might not be the way that everyone wants to play as well. In any case though, not doing too badly when they're played with their wolves. Certainly can be fairly ferocious with a lot of scary combat getting up the board very quickly indeed. Next up we've got the Spiky Dread Knights. The Chaos Knights of win rates are around 48% and appear to have taken down one big event since the data slate. They don't seem to be doing very well at breaking into the top tables though despite being fairly popular with the 10th most played out of 26 armies. Their army rule is Harbingers of Dread for the leadership debuff, and then some extra damage and defense turn 3 for things that you can battle shock. Their detachment rule doubling down on that with Forged in Terror, making enemies test if they've taken any damage on their units. Their index rules do get some fun stuff. The minus 1 AP enhancement is quite nice, as is Doom and Despair turn 1. Rotate Ion Shields will be a staple, they can move through terrain and have some damage buffs to War Dogs. Just their raw stat check with their excessive toughness and lots of heavier melee weapons is going to be hard for some armies to deal with. If they do want a little bit of support, they can ally in demons. Nurglings still remain very popular indeed for some infiltrates and very cheap secondary objective doers. Perhaps the biggest criticism of Chaos Knights is that still optimised lists are still basically running entirely War Dogs. It's still rare to see the big boys on the tabletop in earnest. War Dog Carnivores are just brutal for the melee that they can bring. Brigands are still great. Huntsmen and Stalkers are still fine. Seeing Titanic Knights on the table is still the exception rather than the rule, which is a bit of a shame given that they all went down in points a bit. I feel like that's probably the biggest issue that Games Workshop need to address. Probably the Titanic Knights dropping yet further. I feel like the War Dog Carnivore would still be very good even if you tweaked its points by 5 or 10 points at least. Otherwise the morale shenanigans are just a bit random and apply most strongly later in the game which isn't always great. Against some armies they can be very good and genuinely help on objectives, some armies less so much. Next up and also on 48% wins are the Death Guard. I would perhaps argue that out of the armies here they are stronger than that win rate would imply. They have won 3 big events since the balanced data slate seem to reliably get into the top tables, being 10th out of 26 on the X and 1 per player rate, and people are enjoying putting Mortarian's boys on the tabletop right now, they're the 8th most played army out of the 26 at Grand Tournaments. Their army rule, Gift of Nurgle, gives you an aura of minus 1 toughness, which is nice, certainly helps in close combat, and then their Spread the Sickness gives them sticky objectives, and you can choose either minus 1 to hit or AP debuffs, I feel like the AP is more impactful, but is better against certain armies. They have lots of lethal hits on their data sheets spread throughout all their plague weapons. I feel like maybe one of their standout stratagems is the sustained hits on objectives, which can be pretty brutal when you're scrapping it over a contested point. For the most part, I think Games Workshop's done quite well to balance their units now. Typhus seems pretty much auto-include at 80 points. I see no reason not to run him in literally every list. Death Shroud were good and looking better at 120 points. Their Terminator characters are all strong. They could maybe get to where they need to be with rapid ingress if they like. Mortarians frequently seen on the table. Plagueburst Crawlers still do some good indirect, even at the higher points cost. Bloat Drones and Predators are also fine for the cost. The Biologist Putrefier for the Big Grenade stratagems are still very popular. The Tallyman and the Blightspawn also very nice with cheapish Plague Marines and Rhinos. And you can get allied Nurglings. For army issues, they do maybe still have the problem of being slow moving. I'd still argue they're maybe not quite as tough as you might expect from Death Guard. Maybe a little bit more tough because they're cheap more so than the extra pip of toughness really gives them all that much more. But they do seem to be doing really quite well. Winning events and most units are quite good. I still feel like the Blightlord Terminators could really use a points decrease if I had to single out any one thing. Finally for this bracket we have the Dark Angels. These will represent their numbers just prior to the Codex launch given that Games Workshop held their points cost back for a while. 
Though in all honesty, given those lackluster points numbers, I don't think it's going to change much. They're winning 48% of games, with Iron Storm weirdly leading the way to a surprising extent. Dark Angels Iron Storm has won three big events since the balance data slate, and it seems that they're actually one of the very most likely factions to break into the top tables right now. I do kind of wonder if it's partly due to maybe newer players getting into the army, holding off until the Codex rules go fully live, and the only people playing them are people using Azrael and Ironstorm type things at grand tournaments. As mentioned, Ironstorm with Storm Ravens, a Dark Shroud, and Azrael seems to be the way to play them right now. I'm going to make a video on that for the next video on the channel, hopefully. Quite an interesting specific build that seems to have taken over there. The Unforgiven Task Force is unfortunately just very underpowered and set to remain so with the Codex release, sadly. It does have some useful options with a return fire stratagem and a few other useful bits, though it does just feel to me that you get far less than the Codex based ruined attachments offer. Azrael does seem to be pretty much carrying the faction on his back with his free command points plus great buffs for his lead units. The Land Speeder Dark Shroud seems to have good play with some tough vehicles or the Storm Raven to go alongside it. I feel like when the Codex releases, the Ravenwing Command Squad might be one to watch. You do get a lot of interesting things, and that could affect really quite a big unit of Black Knights. They certainly can put out a fearsome shooting Alpha Strike, maybe with things like Fire Discipline and Gladius even. Otherwise though, a lot of their more unique things just feel kind of middling to weak. The Codex points cost really did disappoint quite a lot of people, myself included. Lionel Johnson and the Deathwing Terminators seem kind of mid for the cost that they have. The Inner Circle Companions are just outright bad, and most of the other characters besides Azrael very so-so and badly balanced against him. As a result, I can't really see the optimal way to play Dark Angels really pivoting away from the weird Ironstorm Azrael thing that we've got going on. Maybe someone will be able to make either the Inner Circle one or the Company of Hunters work somehow. Next up, we have the Upper Mid Armies, things that scored either 49% or 50% in wins. These are say are generally in a pretty good spot within Warhammer 40k, neither overpowered nor undertuned, capable of giving the strongest armies around a good scrap. Adding them on to the big table, here we have Leagues of Votan and Orcs both at 49%, and then Imperial Knights and Drukhari on 50. First up, the Leagues of Votan did get a fair nerf within the balanced data slate. Their three best units arguably went up in cost. I think that wasn't unwarranted given that they had really quite high wins. They're now down to about a 50-50 win rate, which seems quite good to me. They've won one big event since the data slate. They're capable of punching their way into the top tables, though they're still a slightly lower played army than most, probably partly because they're fairly new. Their core mechanic is of course the judgement tokens, getting them plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Without those on the go, their damage does feel a bit pillow fisted. The Games Workshop did radically reimagine their detachment rule, handing out two judgement tokens to four big enemy threats with a command point reward if you slay one of them. And they can double down on that with several interesting damage strats and also void armour on the defensive. They're not an army that's got a whole ton of unit choices. I'd say that the Iron Here Hearthguard really stick out as probably the strongest thing in the index right now. Masses of Vulcanite fire backed up by some Congoshen Gauntlet melee is enough to make a mess of most things maybe led by Karls or Einhair Champions. The Land Fortress and the Sagittor are both solid. All the characters are pretty usable. I would probably rank Uthar below the rest, though. The Hunkin bikes are good for some mobility and objective-grabbing things with their scouting. And perhaps for slightly undertuned stuff, the Hearthkin Berserks, and maybe now the Thunderkin it just feel a little bit tamer than some of the other options, though I still rate all three of those as playable. Overall, definitely still an army that can do well in the hands of a good player, Perhaps the biggest challenge is how to coordinate the Alpha Strikes of the Hearthguard and then really capitalise on those tearing the heart out of the enemy army. They do perhaps feel like an army that just doesn't have that many sneaky tricks or interesting shenanigans that they can pull beyond big damage hits, maybe partly due to having an index that doesn't have that many unit choices. They can be a bit slow on the board as well, particularly for the Hearthguard, which could allow them to be outmanoeuvred a bit later in the game. Next up, we have the war power of the Greenskins. The Orcs are on a 49% win rate. They've won one big tournament since the balance data slate. Maybe struggling to break into the top tables a little bit more than you might expect for their win percentages. And they are a very popular army to play in game right now. Sixth most played at tournaments. Their army rule allows you to call the war. You get one battle round worth of massive melee damages, advance and charge, and invulnerable saves. 
and they back up the close combat violence with the War Tribe giving them sustained hits one in close combat, really making them all about the fighty choppers at the moment. For stratagems they have a nice minus one to wound one that they can pull out, the charge boost can be quite nice coming out of reserves or weird boys as well. Getting a 7 inch charge from there is rather good. In general the majority of forces tend to build around melee pressure sort of lists, boys, knobs, beast nagger boys, mega knobs, maybe squig hog boys, all led by war bosses, beast bosses or maybe smasher squigs. For some alpha level characters the squigasaur beast boss and mozrog scragbad are pretty great, gasgall thrack is pretty usable. For objective scoring grots can get some cheap bodies and farm some command points, storm boys are good secondary duo units. And to get the violent hordes there, trucks can deliver them, and battle wagons and kill rigs are a lot more usable following the points decrease. Unfortunately, Dakar Orcs, for the most part, seem to be really quite underpowered right now versus melee options. Maybe the sole exception being Captain Badrock leading a squad of flash kits, you can get some fairly massive shooting out of them there. I guess the Orcs will have their codex coming fairly soon, will be hopefully a way to allow buggies, walkers and planes to have a bit more efficiency. I feel like we've seen the orc melee detachment, so maybe we'll get some fun mech things or shooting style detachments. It would be nice to have the bad moons have some good representation. Otherwise, perhaps still tough tanks with high saves can be a kind of issue for the boys. A lot of their best units might just struggle to do too much more than scratch the paint there, and have forced into wars of attrition as opposed to just breaking things outright. Next up, and one of the big winners from the data slate were the Imperial Knights. They were doing really quite badly in most games prior to the update. Now it looks like they're winning around about half of games, up 7% on last time. They are an army that tends to do quite a lot better in more casual metas and small RTT type events compared with grand tournaments though. Despite that, they've still won one big tournament, even if the majority of their armies just aren't doing well at breaking into the top flight of play. They are maybe a bit underrepresented compared with how often they're collected as a faction as well, there's far less people putting Imperial Knights on the table versus Chaos Knights at big tournaments right now. For their army rule, they get the Code Chivalric for the nice damage buff with the big rerolls of Lalo the Tyrant. If they slay the enemy Warlord, then they can generate some command points for that as well. Their detachment rule gives them a 6 plus feel no pain type save, moving all the way up to a 5 plus if they get honours. Their stratagems can be pretty powerful as they're affecting big titanic things. Fight on death's quite exciting. The plus one to wound for two CP is quite nice. Tank shock's good. Rotate iron shields is a bit of a staple. I do quite like their mysterious guardian enhancement thing, allowing them to teleport a big titanic shooting knight across the board. Maybe getting line of sight on something that it otherwise couldn't have. For better units for the knights, Canis Rex seems to get played a lot out of the titanics. Besides that, quite a lot of other variants are used. Crusaders, the Errant, Wardens, the Lancer and the Castellan may be some of the more common, all backed up by a hefty amount of armagers, particularly Warglaives that like the boosted rerolls that they get now, maybe a Helverin or two to hold the backfield. Agents of the Imperium also really common to see in support, things like Inquisitorial Henchmen for some cheap units which the Knights don't otherwise get, and Calidus Assassins bounding around the board doing secondaries. For downsides, the Knights definitely do have their weaknesses, a fair bit basic and predictable, even if they do just march up the board with a whole bunch of scary big guns. They can be hampered by terrain, or if they run into an enemy that's got a lot of excessive anti-armour, or things that like to hide a lot, and they might often give up bring it down as a fixed secondary, which can make things easy for certain enemies scoring. They can certainly stat check certain armies though that haven't prepped with enough anti-tank. Perhaps one of the biggest reasons that they can do particularly well in slightly more casual metas than at cutthroat competitive ones. Finally for this bracket we have the Drukari, a win rate of 50% and again a massive improvement on where they were in the game. Again they were perhaps one of the weakest factions in the game prior to the update but now seem to be in an absolutely great place, capable of winning big tournaments with three big event wins since the data slate, breaking into the top tables consistently and while they were one of the least played armies in 40k prior to the update they're now sort of middle of the table, 11th most played out of 26. That's actually really quite high for them given the amount of people that tend to play them. Their army rule power from pain allows you to generate tokens and then feed them into your units for re-rolling hits. It's now been buffed in melee for the extra AP there which is nice for incubi or witches and things. The biggest excitement for them though has been the sky splinter detachment that was added in giving them some really quite nice boosts with their iconic transport playstyle. Lance melee for their close combat units, some great boosts for mobility tricks. Maybe the very scariest thing being the sort of assault ramp rule out of a raider, 
meaning that you can move a Razor or Venom, drop the unit, and then make a charge, potentially threatening charges up to like 24 plus inches across the board. It does mean that in competitive play, the Real Space Raiders list has just basically been dropped. Everyone seems to be using Sky Splinter. With the points adjustments plus the melee buff, Skims Workshop made the vast majority of the Drukhari Codex playable, I think. Raiders and Venoms are going to be staple units for the Sky Splinter, with things like Witches or Incubi with Archons jumping out, maybe Leela Hesperax with the Witches. Scourges are still excellent for anti-tank firepower you can't do much about. Mandrakes can score things. Kronos are hard to go wrong with, with just how tough they are, and Taos are just all-round efficient units, even if they don't use the Sky Splinter much. The Beastmaster can run up the board and do annoying scouting things, maybe doing nuisance charges if needed, and Cabalite Warriors are quite nice units to secure those objectives, while still staying safe within transports if they need to. Broadly speaking, I think there's a lot to like about the new style Drukhari, a lot more fun and a lot more dangerous melee units. And they actually seem to have landed in a space where they're really quite strong in game, but not actually overpowered. Maybe if I had to criticise one unit's balance, it'd probably be the Helions that still don't really seem to have much of a place in the index. Moving onwards and just very, very slightly upwards, here are armies that seem to be doing rather well in Warhammer 40k right now. Quite a cluster of armies all on 51 or 52% wins, and then just the two factions above that that seem to be standout best in 40k. Putting them on the list, we've got the Chaos Demons, Tau Empire, Eldari, Grey Knights, Thousand Sons, Adeptus Auroritus, and the Black Templars. Starting out, the Chaos Demons had a fair bit of apathy towards them before the update, but Games Workshop did slash the cost on a whole load of their lesser played units. Quite a significant chunk of the Codex went down in points. It seems it's been enough to bump their win rate up to a 51%, even if they're not winning any big events yet. They are still breaking into the top tables and more people are choosing to play with them again. Their army rule is the Shadow of Chaos, maintaining a stranglehold on the mid board to allow some very close deep strikes and maybe charges from deep strike, plus some battle shock and regeneration type tricks. They play very differently to most other factions in the game. Lots of melee units, lots of invulnerable saves and some interesting teleport style tricks like dropping just outside of 3 inches or returning to reserves. After the update, I feel like the units in their really quite big roster are a lot more balanced than they used to be. I still think the Nurglings are kind of stand out for annoying interference at a low, low cost. But beyond that, I've seen Chaos Demon lists doing well that are very different from each other. Belacor's often still played as a linchpin of the army, shielding a chunk of army from your enemy's firepower, and then carrying along his own Shadow of Chaos into the midboard. Most of the greater demons are strong, and you'd likely want at least some of those to deal with enemy heavy hitters. Maybe the Great Unclean one with the 4 plus feel no pain enhancement might be one of my single favourite out of them now. It's just monstrously tough for how much he costs, and it'll just chip away at enemy units. Besides that, quite a lot of stuff is usable. Blood Crushers bring some big melee. Flamers are nice and have overwatch options. Celeste can respawn and hit the enemy back hard. Plague Bearers are tough chaff to hold objectives. And they do have some good lone operative style characters. Perhaps for weaknesses, anything with vast amounts of volume fire are going to be less good news due to the high invulnerable saves. Maybe strong bid more presence could counter the Shadow of Chaos. I feel like maybe the standard army for them is a bit less obvious, with a lot of things being okay and usable, though not stand out strong, but maybe that's for the best for internal balance. Nice to see them in a slightly more positive place at least. Next up, we've got the Forces of the Greater Good and the Tau Empire. They've got a win rate of 51%, a little bit improved on before. One big event since the data slate, and seeming to be one of the best factions at going X and 1 in tournaments, 5th out of 26 per their player rate, despite being fairly popular. Looks like plenty of Tau armies are going to be hitting the top tables. Their core rule is for the greater good, units working in tandem to give a paired unit plus 1 ballistic skill. Then from turn 3 onwards, the patient hunters get Kao Yon, with sustained hits on turns 3 to 5, for a late game damage boost. I say their stratagems and enhancements maybe aren't quite so standout. You can have a Crisis Commander with early Kao Yon for some big damage there. The Jump Shoot Jump stratagem for Crisis Suits are nice as well. Maybe extra AP for Coordinated Fire. For the most part, I feel like they've done at least alright with making most of their units at least playable, even if there's maybe a few things that get picked a lot more than others. Crisis Suits just often get built around via necessity, I think, with lots of Cyclic Ion Blasters typically. Cold Star Commanders can be good for them. They've got Ghost Kills and other good lone operatives like Ornvar. Maybe a bit of an annoying over-reliance on Tetras for the best guiding that the army can bring. Lots of good more mainline damage dealers like Broadsides, Hammerheads and Skyrays. 
Riptide's less damage, but really quite tough with the invulnerable save for how cheap they are now. Shadow Sun's an interesting blend of a lone operative plus a synergy piece, and they've got lots of chaff units for objectives. Troop Carnivores and Hounds, Stealth Suits and Vespids, they can all be handy to have around. Overall, hopefully Games Workshop managed to keep the Tau Empire with the vast majority of their units being at least interesting when the Codex comes out. It's going to be a big shake-up with lots of detachments added, plus a whole bunch of Croot reinforcements on the way. Maybe things like those Rampages could shake up the builds a bit, giving the Tau something that hits quite hard in close combat. Next up, it does look good that Eldari are just no longer the single strongest faction in Warhammer 40k. It's been quite a long time coming since 10th edition launched. Seems like they're still remaining at least strong though, a win rate of 51%, even if that is a big decrease on where they were. And they still seem to be consistently topping tournaments. Five big event wins since the balanced data slate, which is pretty standout. Being very good at breaking into the top tables, though they've slid down to 7th most played faction in tournaments. A bunch of people choosing to play something else, I guess given that they were previously the single most played. Their army rule strands of face allows you to sub in some fate dice for rolls once per phase. That was vastly toned down from where it was before though, only having 6 dice now, not 12. Their attachment rule still brings loads of extra damage with re-rolling a hit roll and wound roll whenever they attack. Great for anti-tank weapons, say support weapons or war walkers. They have some fun enhancements like the phoenix gem which could be good on an autark way leaper. And the detachment has some very good movement shenanigans that they can do, including Phantasm, to do some problematic infantry movement in the enemy turn with perfect knowledge. Games Workshop did hit a lot of their strongest things, often with rules nerfs more so than points. As a result, perhaps a little bit more variability as to what sort of stuff gets played. Farsea is a nice to plug in some automatic 6 fate dice, now there's a limited supply. Fortune's good for a minus 1 to wound. Guardians could generate some more fate dice. War Walkers can get you some strong anti-tank. Autarchs generate CP and the Way Leaper version can do some lone operative things while he does so. Perhaps particularly standout are their fast objective snatchers, Shadow Spectres with the move shoot move, Warp Spiders with the huge 24 inch jump and the cheaper and fast moving swooping hawks. Illicum Rangers can be a lone operative unit that's a pain to deal with and genuinely threaten enemy characters. The Avatar of Kane is maybe one of the biggest baddest things to be taking damage for the army. And since they got nerfed heavily towards the start of 10th edition, the support weapons seem to be back in style as well, with a few more D cannons being included in army lists. Inaris also seem to be a good way to play Eldari as well, allowing you to bring Battlehost style rerolls to Drukhari Lance things, which things like Scourges and Ravagers will really quite like, and also allows them to use Mandrakes as quite a popular objective skirmisher choice. Overall, they're still quite a fragile army that relies on movement tricks, they might get punished by particularly fast, hard hitting enemies or teleporting or indirect fire, perhaps moving to a point where they're not quite as easy to play as they used to be in the past, but overall in a strong place, and still absolutely winning tournaments. Next up, and an army that really seems to have risen up in power, are the Grey Knights. They've got a 51% win rate, so a plus 4 on where they were before. Two big event wins since the balanced data slate, not too bad for a slightly lower played army than some, and doing well to break into the top tables reliably on the X and 1 wins. The Grey Knights still have their Teleport Assault as their big focus for the army, units redeploying on and off the board at the end of the enemy turn and turning up sort of Deep Strike style next turn. Now much more relevant is their Teleport Shun Detachment rule as well for the auto advance 6 inches, given that Dread Knights are back, otherwise nice with the Mist of Diamoth to allow you to return things to reserve. The Citadel of Exigence can do that when they're shot, and they can return 1 unit to Deep Strike just outside of 3 inches as well, which can be really quite disruptive to enemies trying to screen them out. Certainly the biggest change since the balance update are that Dread Knights have gone from being a seldom took unit to one that seems to be absolutely auto-include. Perhaps the biggest change was the Psy Cannon gaining ignore cover and extra AP. It turned it from something that would just whiff against high saves to something that can actually threaten them again. And the extra close combat damage definitely didn't hurt either. It's good to have at least something that can really tangle with the enemy tough units, something that was a massive weakness for the faction before. Otherwise, Terminators and Paladins may be backed up by Drago or Librarians are solid. Purifiers maybe with Crow is quite fun. People often run at least some Strike Marines to get sticky objectives, and the other power armor choices are alright. It can also be nice to get at least some Agents of the Imperium as well, maybe things like Henchmen Warbands to cheaply hold down some points. In terms of main issues, they maybe still struggle to kill heavy targets a little bit, and movement tricks also only get you so far given that you still have to commit to the enemy at some point, 
I feel like Dread Knights have really started to help out with that. Overall, finally, looks like Grey Knights are generally considered strong within 40k 10th, which has been a long time coming. Next up for their Sorceress rivals, we've got the Thousand Suns. They're also on a 51% wins. They do seem to be doing very well at winning big tournaments, though, with four wins since the data slate. Reliably getting into the top tables, even if they seem to be one of the lesser played factions in the game. The Scions of Magnus get their Cabal of Sorcerers rule, trading out points for some big spells, whether it's damage with Doom Bolt, stripping enemy saves, or movement shenanigans and things. Their Cult of Magic Detachment amping up their psychic damage that a lot of the Sorcerers and, of course, Magnus himself have in style. And basically, most of their enhancements are very usable indeed. Maybe the Umbralific Crystal stands out as a particularly nice one for a teleport move for some otherwise slow units around the board. Perhaps the biggest criticism of Thousand Suns are that their lists tend to be a bit mono build at the moment. The vast majority of competitive lists seem to start with both Magnus and Araman, Magnus being the big linchpin for massive damage and also a focus for rituals, Araman just generally strong for his cost, then fill out with a whole bunch of Rubik Marines led by various flavours of sorcerers, mix and match, literally all of them are usable and interesting for their cost. And then from that core of the army taking up the vast majority of points, they tend to be supported by some combination of Zangors, Enlightened, Scarab Occult Terminators, Mutaliths, or Spawn. They're generally kind of small points investment out of those ones. Overall though, it feels like they're broadly in a fairly good place. Nice to have Rubik Marines and Sorcerers as such a big focus as the most iconic units in the faction. I feel like it is kind of hard to maybe make other things to be interesting but not take away from that too much. Many armies needing to build around quite a lot of Cabal points to get those on the board, and then a perhaps a slightly higher skill faction than some with some big decisions as to how you spend those and whether or not you use them for movement damage or stripping saves and things. Certainly some big commitments that you could choose to get right or wrong. Overall fairly good though I think, maybe could use some very small decreases, maybe a tiny bit off Scarab Occult Terminators to make them a bit more interesting. Next up we have the Adeptus of Auroritas, winning around about 51% of games, which is a fair bit decreased on the very, very strong start that they had in the first few weeks after the data slate. It seems that early on, just a very small amount of very skilled players seems to carry the faction to some fairly ridiculous win statistics. I did suspect that once a few more people got games in, it had averaged out a lot more. They do seem to be an army that does a bit better in a grand tournament competitive sort of meta with people running optimised things as opposed to for your more average player in an RTT or a casual game. They've won four big events since the balanced data slates, not including the one where someone supposedly got disqualified. Though despite that, they don't actually seem to be that great at breaking into the top tables compared with other units of their competitors here. And still at least fairly lower played compared with some armies out there, 18th out of 26 most played at tournaments. The sisters' core mechanic are the acts of faith, generating miracle dice and then sobbing them into big rolls, maybe for damage results of 6 or automatic lethal hits and things. Their units can get a bit more vicious as they take casualties with Blood of the Martyrs, potentially getting very lethal if you've just got a few models left in a squad. They've got fun stratagems to resurrect a character, get a plus 1 to wound on the charge which could be fun with Arco Flagellants. A fairly brutal combat trick that you can use to make one scary enemy unit attack something unimportant to justify you charging with something else. I feel like Broadly Games Workshop did a very good job with the points updates this time around. Previously they were just a little bit too hamstrung into Castigators and Exorcists as the strong way to play them. I think they hit the vast majority of the units they needed to with points decreases and their elite infantry units seem to be flourishing a bit more as a result. Perhaps one of the single most auto-include units seems to be more than Val and a new unit of Paragon Warsuits that do seem just very strong for their cost. At least some Battle Sisters tend to be used for farming miracles on objectives and maybe directing them through a multi-melter of theirs, perhaps often with an immolator in tow to split them in half into two units of five, as well as bringing the multi-melters itself. Seraphim and Zephyrim are both cheap units that move fast for secondaries and a little bit of threat. Arco Flashlands still blend things nicely with their mass twin linked attacks, maybe jumping out of rhinos. At least some people are using Repentia as an alternative to them now, which is kind of fun. Castigators are still good and Exorcists are still playable despite the points premium. Indirect firepower is still very nice to have, particularly with that kind of threat. The Palatine with the Blade of St. Eleanor is another popular choice. Really big melee damage and lethal hits is good. The Triumph and Celestine are still nice and small interference units are good as well, such as very tiny units of Crusaders. They could be a good one to do secondary objectives or use that annoying melee strat. Overall, again, seem to be in a good spot. 
the vast majority of their most iconic units usable at a high level of play and doing well. Again, like the past two, I think another higher skill army compared with some. Plenty of their units just aren't stand out durable when they take enemy firepower, so require some careful play around terrain. It still does feel a bit weird to have multi melters quite so unreliable against tanks and require miracle dice and things to actually make them puncture enemy armor with some sort of regularity. Lastly, for this tier, and just noting a little bit ahead of the rest on the win rates, are the Black Templars. They've got a 52% on the wins, three big tournament wins. And in terms of armies that are taking themselves to the top tables, they're the second most successful in terms of X and 1 results. It does seem that Black Templars are one of the easiest ways to do well at tournaments with Space Marines. As a divergent chapter, they still get the Space Marine Earth of Moment, and then, interestingly enough, an army that does have multiple genuinely different ways to play. Their Righteous Crusaders detachment has always been a good one, and does genuinely hold its own against the Gladius. Getting a 6 plus feel no pain if the others don't make more sense is nice, plus they can get that to a 5 plus feel no pain with the Tearn Houses bones on one unit and have some good melee support stratagems. Aside from the Dark Angel Storm Raven type thing, they also seem to be one of the very best ways to run Iron Storm as well. Getting incredibly cheap bolt-on multi-melters to their tanks just works excellently with their rerolls and just making Space Marine tanks more dangerous, and Gladius can certainly support their melee units pretty well as well. I do feel like they were a bit diminished from where they were doing before. It does look like their win rate's gone down slightly since prior to the data slate. They took some nerfs to the Space Marine support units and a few of their unique things, though I'd argue that the vast majority of their divergent unit roster is still stronger than most. Grimaldus and Hellbrex both cost you more, but I think both are very justifiable. Hellbrex for massive damage and Grimaldus for 5 plus feel no pains in a Crusader squad. The Primaris Crusaders still put lots of scary Space Marines on the board for cheap. The Firstborn ones bring you very cheap last cannon to the table, which are nice in Ironstorm. The Sword Brethren are a fantastically dangerous melee unit that work well with the better impulsors that the Black Templar gets, and just the bolt-on multi-melters on repulsors and gladiators are pretty stand out there as well. Overall, while they do seem to be a bit behind the absolute leaders of Warhammer 40k on the win rates, they do seem to be one of the strongest factions in the game right now, pretty much the way to play several forms of Space Marines, and most certainly a threat to be reckoned with. Finally though, that leaves just two factions left. These appear to be the strongest factions by win rate. It does look like, for raw stats, these guys are just better than the other factions by at least a noticeable margin, even if it's nowhere near quite as crazy overtuned as we had with 70% win rate Eldar at the start of the edition. Looks like Necrons and Custodies are both just over 55% right now at win rate at present, though I have seen them fluctuating between 54 and 57% over the past few weeks, depending on source. Even if they're not enormously different to Games Workshop's 55% wins target, it seems very likely that both of these will at least get some sort of nerf in the next balance pass. Their tournament stats do seem to stick out over and above the other ones that we just talked about. Putting them on the board, there we have our big table of win rates of Warhammer 40k, ranging down from Codex Space Marines and Death Watch with Ammech at the bottom, to Custodies and Necrons reigning supreme up at the top. First up, we have the Golden Boys of the Adeptus Custodes. These guys are winning around about 55% of games right now, plus 12% on where they are, and easily the single biggest winners of the balanced data slate, despite I'd argue the changes maybe not being all that earth-shattering. Around about a 10% points cut to their core units, plus Aegis of the Emperor being good against devastating wounds again, but apparently that was all it took to flip them from being one of the punching bags of 40k to being the ones that are doing the punching to the other armies. They have won five big events since the data slate, so it does look like this still carries over to the top tier of grand tournaments. Often custodians tend to be in a space where they do well but struggle to actually win due to being maybe a little bit more simplistic to play. They aren't at the very top of breaking into the top tables, they were certainly up there at 4th out of 26, and it looks like that they're the second most common army to play in games of 40k at tournaments. A very easy army to get into and fairly popular, and very strong right now. For their army rule, they get the Martial Qatar. They get to choose a combat boost in the fight phase, lethal hits or sustained hits on offer, amongst others. They get the Aegis of the Emperor to protect their big stat lines against mortal wounds and now devastating wounds again. A 4 plus save against both of those it protects them against the things that are most likely to get through their 2 plus saves and big invulnerables. And otherwise, they do have a fair bit of good support. A fight's first stratagem that can be very intimidating on objectives. Resurrect a custodian for 1 CP 
a damage buff against monsters and characters and things, and a few usable enhancements for blade champions or shield captains. With the way that Games Workshop redid the points last time, they really have pushed your core custodians with the guardian spears to be by far the strongest thing in the army. The custodian guard, Alaris terminators and wardens tend to make up the majority of the army's points, usually backed up by Trajan Valoris, blade champions or the shield captain on foot, all of which are really quite good for the custodian guard or wardens. Sisters of Silence are cheap and usable for actions and objectives. A Callister's Assassin can be nice to jump around to do secondary objective things. Kyria Draxus is very popular in a custodian guard squad for her buffs, plus their surprisingly good wound rolls with her shooting. And if you want a bit of dedicated anti-armor, you could use a Caladius Grav Tank, which is still fairly effective big hitting anti-tank with a 2 plus save. Overall, Adeptus Custodians just seem to be really quite strong right now, able to stat check certain armies out there who just can't deal with this many wounds of this high armour. Fairly intimidating general purpose melee profiles, that are going to lay low some of the nastiest things that the enemy can bring to bear. Maybe limited shooting options outside of Forge World are one of their weaknesses, plus perhaps a few less sneaky tricks than some other armies out there. They're both an army that's easy to play and strong at the moment, Marching up the board with a bunch of Guardian Spears will certainly get you a long way. If you can manage any clever positioning sort of shenanigans along the way, or do some fun teleport tricks with Terminators, then so much the better. Finally, that leaves us with the soulless living metal that are the Necrons. Again, 55% wins, and unsurprisingly pretty much the same as they were prior to the balance update. And as a lot of people were suspecting, they do seem to be winning the most tournaments out of any faction out there. Nine big event wins since the balance data slate happened. It looks like they're the most likely to break into the top tables at tournaments with the most X and 1 placings. And just to cement their clean sweep on the tournament stats, it looks like they're the single most played faction at tournaments as well. I think as a lot of people saw coming, they basically win by every metric, even if they do have Custodes as a more major rival, and plenty of other things that really aren't that far behind and can certainly compete at a competitive level. The army rule is the reanimation protocols for repairing and reviving models, meaning that when you've got big durability things, they can regrow wounds and undo a lot of the enemy's hard work. And then for competitive detachments, people tend to play either Canoptic Court or Hypercrypt. Canoptic Court giving you some nice re-rolls on Wraiths and Doomstalkers, plus flon shenanigans like reactive moves and hiding them from enemy shooting. That can be really problematic while you're trying to shoot them dead. A big block of Wraiths infiltrating into the midfield and then just being thrown at the enemy, tying up a bunch of stuff right from turn one, it's probably not what most armies want as well. Hypercrypt Legion allows you to warp units around the board. Plenty of interesting things for dealing damage out of Deep Strike and can support the Monolith really well. And that tends to be just extra good with the Mighty Mighty Katarn at the moment. Ridiculous damage and defensive stats with their main weakness being that they move kind of slowly. For standout units, I feel like a good portion of Necron strength is just carried by the kind of crazily undercosted Katarn. I think just about everyone could tell that they were problematically undercosted just as soon as they gave them that 5 plus fail no pain without changing the points whatsoever. At that kind of points cost, it seems auto include to have about 2 in just about every competitive Necron list, the Nightbringer and the Void Dragon being maybe the most popular, some lists going very heavy with multiple transcendents. I can't help but think that if Games Workshop just costed the Katarn properly for their abilities, then probably the rest of the Necron army wouldn't really need all that much doing to it, and they'd be a lot more balanced with other armies in the game. Otherwise, for standout stuff though, Vase and Technomancers are just great units to be durable and gum up the midfield, particularly in Canoptech Court, though they're usable in plenty of other places. Immortals are a nice battle line unit with plenty of support characters. They can be fun with Chronomancers in Hypercrypts for dropping and then moving shenanigans. Imitech can rustle up some command points. Illuminor Seraz is just generally strong and helps out Immortals a lot. Individual Locust Destroyers and Scarab Swarms are often used for some secondary support. Maybe some nice cheap Death Marks to Deep Strike in to do some secondaries and deal a little damage as well. And they do have some nice strong anti-tank weapons. The Doomstalkers in Canoptech Court, maybe Locust Heavy Destroyers or Doomsday Arcs in other detachments. Overall, it does seem that there's good arguments that the Necrons are the very strongest faction in Warhammer 40k right now, and I would argue that it's primarily due to those undercosted Katarn. If Games Workshop bump up the cost a little bit to make them a bit more fair versus other armies' options, they'd likely be a lot more in line with most of the rest. It will be quite nice to have a bit more internal balance restored. It'd be nice to see Necron Warriors and maybe Scorpec Destroyers come to the fore a little more. Both just feel a bit overcosted for what they really bring right now. 
So anyway, here's a rough graph of 40k win rates at the moment. Maybe a few too many armies towards the lower end of the table right now. I would certainly say that it's at the point where the majority of armies can compete pretty well against each other, and for all the balance complaints between factions, it's definitely far, far better than it's been at many times in 40k's past. Space Marines in particular do feel like they're in a weird place, both being at the bottom of the table and then arguably third best in the form of Black Templars. I feel like Games Workshop really have written themselves in a way that it's kind of hard to boost the one without boosting the other. Otherwise, just to go through some quick tables of the other metrics, these are the raw numbers of event wins per faction. It's Necrons, Custodies, and Eldari leading the pack here, and the top half of 40k factions have won at least two. There are plenty that are less represented, but at least some of that is just due to random chance. Winning a grand tournament is always going to be a bit dependent on the exact player and the matchups they get. I certainly expect to see some more wins for Tau at some point soon. And Chaos Demons, for example, seem to be doing fine by the other metrics. Here are the armies ranked for current play rates at tournaments. This will be a mix of how many people play the army, plus how strong and excited people are to play the faction right now. Not too surprising to see Necrons and Custodies right at the top. Tyranids and Space Marines are always up there, kind of similar with Guard and Orcs. And compared with other times for play rates in the past, Drukhari are being played a lot more than they often are. Maybe Knights a bit less so than normal. And at the bottom of the table, we've got Abmech, Gene Still Occult, and Death Watch. All armies that are lesser played the most, though Abmech and Death Watch in particular may be not helped out by kind of lackluster or unexciting rules. Finally, here are those X and 1 results per play rate of the army, so basically the likelihood of any given player to take only one defeat in a big tournament, so the armies that kind of reliably make their way onto the top tables. Again, for the most part, maybe not too many dissimilarities with the overall win rates for the factions here. Perhaps for surprises near the top, the Dark Angels seem to be very overrepresented, with their few people playing with the Ironstorm detachments. I wouldn't be too surprised if that's not quite as upheld once their Codex comes out and people start playing with their Codex detachments a lot more. Otherwise, for standout ones near the bottom, it does look like Guard are kind of super low despite doing well at actually winning tournaments. Tyranids in particular seem to be doing very badly here, quite a lot more so than Space Marines, also considered to be one of the newer sort of starting style factions. And Imperial Knights are also kind of surprisingly low for their win rate. I guess there's probably quite a lot of players going, say, like 3 and 2 in grand tournaments there, rather than 4 and 1 or 5 and 1. In any case, I think I'll leave that there for this one. Let me know your thoughts on game balance in Warhammer 40k right now, and any other insights for your given faction, even with a full hours overview. You can only sort of do a very brief run through each faction, so I'm sure I've skimmed over a few important things that probably should have been talked about for each faction. In any case, feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics if you'd like to see more like this. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, with new ones out just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these videos coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.